In the headlines, Korea's rival political parties postpone a plenary session until next week to put off a vote on the president's new pick for prime minister. The nominee's alleged ethical lapses highlighted his confirmation hearing. A court sentences a former vice president of Korean Air to one year in prison for obstructing aviation safety in her nut rage incident. And Russian President Vladimir Putin announces a new ceasefire deal from Ukraine peace talks that could potentially end a 10-month conflict that's claimed more than 5,000 lives. Hello and welcome to Adira News. Thanks for tuning in. Coming to you live from Seoul, I am Kang Tae-ri. We begin with the latest on the so-called nut rage incident. A Seoul court has sentenced the former vice president of Korean Air, Cho hyun to one year in prison. Our Kim Hyun-bin reports. A Seoul District Court sentenced former vice president of Korean Air, Cho hyun to one year in prison for obstructing aviation safety after she ordered a taxing plane to return back to the gate last December. Her lawyers are looking into the possibility of a pun to charge. Cho, the eldest daughter of the chairman of Korean Air, faced five charges ranging from obstruction of justice through deception and changing the plane's flight path, which carries the heaviest sentence of up to 10 years in prison with no possibility of suspension or parole. Cho pleaded innocent to the charge, arguing the runway should not be considered part of the flight path. Ahead of the ruling, she submitted six letters of apology to the judges, appealing for leniency. Cho had ordered a senior crew member to deplane in New York last December over a lapse in proper procedure for serving nuts to passengers in first class. The soul-bound flight from New York was heading for the runway before she ordered it to return back to the gate. This case has gripped the Korean public from the start, as many see it as another glaring example of misbehavior by a member of a conglomerate, or so-called Chebar family, who believe that with their power and influence, they can act and do as they please. Typically, local courts have gone relatively easy on Chebar leaders convicted of crimes by granting them pardons or handing down light punishment. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirai News. A dramatic day at Korea's National Assembly. Rival parties have agreed to put off the plenary session to next Monday, dodging the possibility of a head-on conflict over a vote on the prime minister nominee. Our Park ji has more. The country's two main rival parties have agreed to postpone a vote on the confirmation of Prime Minister nominee Lee Wan Gu. After a contentious afternoon, that led them to call off the session until next Monday. Earlier in the day, lawmakers from the main opposition party boycotted parliamentary activities. They were protesting the confirmation of the nominee in committee this Thursday afternoon, with only lawmakers from the ruling Senate party unilaterally voting to move the vote onto the full assembly. Earlier in the morning, the ruling Senate party had urged the opposition party to cooperate and allow the vote to proceed as scheduled in order to avoid a vacuum in state affairs. Even long before I was elected floor leader, when the nominee was still the floor leader of the party, both parties had agreed that the full assembly would vote on the nominee following the two-day confirmation hearing. However, the main opposition party said it hoped to delay the vote to sometime later this month, given the various allegations surrounding the nominee's past. Since I have worked with the nominee who was my previous counterpart on many issues at the assembly, I really wanted him to come through the confirmation hearing well. Unfortunately and very regrettably, he has fallen short of people's expectations. The ruling Senate party holds a majority in the assembly, and if we wanted to, it could go ahead with the vote on its own. However, experts say it's not likely as the presidential office has already been criticized for its lack of compromise and communication, especially with personnel matters. The burden of pushing through the confirmation might be too heavy for the administration and potentially cripple future assembly sessions. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. 
Korea's ambassador to China, Kwon Young Se, is expected to be replaced soon. He played an important role in President Park Geun Hye's presidential election victory back in 2012, and local reports say he's likely to be re replaced in the foreign ministry's upcoming shakeup. He is one of the figures whose names have been floating around for either the new unification minister or presidential chief of staff. President Park has said she will carry out. A reshuffle of the cabinet and top office after her new prime minister is approved by the National Assembly. The tone and words of Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in his upcoming statement marking the 70th anniversary of the end of the Second World War has incited conflict in Japan. Ari Kanakim tells us more. A debate is raging in Japan's parliament over a statement to be delivered by Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in August to mark the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. Last month, Abe indicated he will not use certain terms such as colonial rule and aggression, deep remorse, or heartfelt apology, which were included in Tokyo's 1995 statement by then Prime Minister Domichi Murayama. The country's main opposition Democratic Party has labeled Abe's remarks intolerable and demanded the content of his statement be shared with and discussed in parliament, not just within the confines of Abe's cabinet. Don't you think it's necessary to discuss the contents of the statement with parliament for the sake of national consent? It's hard to pass a resolution in parliament. We announce a statement under our cabinet. And in a rare move, the new Komeito party, part of Abe's ruling coalition, has voiced its concerns, saying the past statements were announced after consultation with lawmakers. The statement is accepted at home and abroad as the basic position of Japan. It's common sense that a consensus is reached within the coalition parties. Adding to the conflict and confusion, the chairman of Abe's ruling Liberal Democratic Party's general counsel, Toshihiro Nikai, said it's only sensible that the cabinet coordinate the upcoming statement with different parties. The international community has been calling on Japan to address its historic past wrongdoings and issue a sincere apology. And with Japanese lawmakers calling for Abe to strike a forgiving tone, analysts say the Japanese leader is under growing pressure to make a heartfelt apology for Japan's past wrongdoings. Connie Kim, Arirang News. South Korea's defense budget was the 10th largest in the world last year. It came in at $34.4 billion, just behind Germany with roughly $44 billion, according to a report from the International Institute for Strategic Studies. The United States topped the list with $643 trillion, followed by China, and Saudi Arabia. North Korea, by the way, did not make it onto the list, but the institute says Pyongyang has made great strides in enhancing its missile program and weapons of mass destruction. It added that as a result of the 2008 financial crisis, NATO and European countries have significantly reduced their forces, while Asian countries are investing more in defense. Global credit rating agency Moody's says lower oil prices may not necessarily be a boon for the global economic growth. It says the effects of falling oil prices will be offset by the slumping eurozone economies and a slowdown in economies like China, Japan and Russia. It did say, however, that lower oil prices coupled with what it called a favorable economic environment for the U.S. will benefit the U.S. economy economy, encouraging consumer and corporate spending. For years now, Korean chipmakers have stayed among the top five in the global DRAM market. And for the very first time last year, their combined market share topped 70 percent, thanks largely to technological advances and steady demand. Our Kim Jiang reports. 
Korean memory chip makers dominated the global DRAM market with a share of more than 70 percent during the September to December period of last year. The combined market share of Korean companies during the period is the highest recorded of 0.7 percent from the previous quarter. Tech giant Samsung Electronics held more than 41 percent of the market, while SK Hynix took up a near 28 percent. They were closely followed by U.S. chip maker Micron Group. Technological advance were key to the leading performances, says market tracker DRAM Exchange. Samsung Electronics produces smaller products than its rivals. Its 20 and 23 nanometer chips are 1 50th the width of a human hair. Also, SK Hynix improved the manufacturing process for its 25 nanometer chips by reducing the number of defective products. Their high performance is expected to continue this year as well on the back of steady chip prices. The global market for DRAM memory chips is expected to increase 13 percent from last year to nearly 53 billion U.S. dollars. As of Thursday morning, prices for DDR2 were traded at around $1.24, down 0. 3 percent from the previous day. Kim Jung, Arirang News. Korea's town Kakao has reported impressive fourth quarter results. The local IT giant says its profits for the final three months of last year were up more than 70 percent to nearly 60 million U.S. dollars, largely driven by strong advertising sales. The strong earnings come after the merger of Town Corporation and Kakao Talk last October. On top of its mobile messaging service, the company has rolled out mobile money transaction services and a tax hailing application since the merger. Washington's announcement that it's lifting its embargo on Cuba means more than words to businesses around the world. And with the business opportunities widening on the trade front, the Korean government is also gearing up to prepare its domestic exporters to take advantage of this chance. Our Song Jisun has this report. From accessories and telecom devices to electronics and autos. Those are some of the items Korean exporters could soon be sending over to Cuba, a market that is soon to be given a strong boost after the U.S. announced its plan to lift its decades old embargo. An estimate by the Korea Trade Investment Promotion Agency suggests that foreign direct investment to Cuba will jump 17 times from the current $1 billion to $17 billion when the U.S. sanctions are completely removed. Seoul's outbound shipments to Havana stood at $56 million last year, while imports stood at $12 million. Kutra says Korean companies could use the Cuban market as a bridge to enter Central and South America, but cautions they should also be aware of the rigid government regulations there, as well as the lack of liquidity among prospective partner companies in the island nation. To hedge against the risks, Seoul is taking practical steps to help exporters explore the new business opportunities. The Korea Trade Insurance Corporation on Monday signed an MOU with Cuba Central Bank to provide $70 million in trade insurance to Korean companies seeking to export their products. In its bid to re-establish diplomatic ties with Cuba after more than five decades, Seoul is also offering humanitarian aid to Havana, engaging in a development program for the country for the first time. Earlier this week, Seoul's foreign ministry signed an MOU with the UN World Food Program for a $3 million project aimed at improving food production output and reducing poverty in Cuba by 2017. Song ji Sun, Arirang News. More people in Korea are reporting child abuse and more reported cases are being brought to justice. Data submitted to a ruling party lawmaker by the Welfare Ministry Thursday shows that nearly 18,000 cases of child abuse were reported last year, of which roughly 9,800 cases were determined as a child abuse and flagged for monitoring. That's about a 44 percent jump from the number in 2013. Expert attribute this increase to a special law that went into effect last September that strengthens punishments for child abuse. They added that more people have become aware of what constitutes a child abuse from increased media coverage and public attention on this issue. 
Eating healthy, it's uh, something most of us would like to try to do, but it turns out that food that we once thought was bad for us might not be that bad after all. A government advisory panel in the U.S. says, contrary to past recommendations, we should not worry too much about having too much cholesterol in our diets. Our Kwanzua tells us more. Before, when you reached out for food high in cholesterol like eggs or shrimps, you might have thought twice, especially if you're an older adult. But now researchers in the U.S. say you might be all right to tuck into your heart's content after all. At least that's what an influential nutrition advisory panel in the U.S. says as it scrapped a warning against LDL cholesterol often dubbed as the bad cholesterol from its nutrition guidelines. In a first in 40 years, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee's decision also runs counter to its last reform made five years ago when it advised people to take in less than 300 milligrams of cholesterol a day, which is equivalent to the amount found in an egg. The instructional changes come as more nutritionists say years of research show that high cholesterol food does not greatly influence the health of ordinary adults. They believe that consuming these foods doesn't significantly raise levels of cholesterol in the blood or increase the risk of heart disease. Having too many foods high in saturated fats like butter and red meat, they say, is much more dangerous. The guidelines also warns patients with diabetes to still be cautious when eating high cholesterol foods. The committee plans to send its final draft to the government's health and agriculture department in order to issue its 2015 dietary guidelines for the public. While some experts say cholesterol should have been dropped off the warning list years ago, others remain skeptical and still stand by previous research. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Russian President Vladimir Putin has announced a fresh ceasefire agreement in the latest diplomatic effort to halt the deadly conflict in eastern Ukraine. For more, we turn to Paul Lee at the News Center. Paul, needless to say, this is a welcomed announcement, and it came after marathon peace talks in Belarus ended with both Moscow and Kiev shaking hands. That's right. The heads of state from Germany, France, Ukraine and Russia had been locked in negotiations for more than 15 hours, which lasted through the night. And just when hopes of a breakthrough were lost, this new ceasefire deal emerged. Putin said the truce would take effect as early as this Sunday. He also pledged that all heavy weapons would be withdrawn from the front lines in the next two weeks, while making sure Ukraine regains control of its borders. French President Francois Hollande and his Ukrainian counterpart Petro Poroshenko said that a comprehensive political solution had been reached. However, despite those assurances, it's still uncertain if the separatist leaders will uphold the terms, as similar deals in the past were rarely observed. This as fighting continues to rage on in the east of the country. On Wednesday, more than 20 Ukrainian soldiers and civilians were reportedly killed, including those in the rebel-held region of Donetsk. The conflict between government forces and pro-Russian rebels has already cost the lives of at least 5,300 people over the last 10 months. Mm -hmm. And with the threats from Islamic State militants not showing any signs of dwindling, U.S. President Barack Obama has taken a big step forward. He's laid out a proposal to bring the fight to these extremists. What are the details? Well, determined to fight the extremist group wherever they exist, the American president has asked Congress to authorize military action against them. It marks the first time a U.S. president has asked for congressional approval to go to war since 2002, ahead of the Iraq invasion. Our Kim and Ji has more. U.S. President Barack Obama has made a formal request to Congress to authorize military force against a terrorist group that calls itself Islamic State. This resolution reflects our core objective to destroy ISIL. It supports the comprehensive strategy that we've been pursuing with our allies and our partners. In a televised speech, Obama noted the military campaign is a difficult mission, but said the U.S. is on the front foot and IS is going to lose. The request does not call for the deployment of ground troops, although a separate letter to Congress did state that it will be limited to rescue operations or the use of special operations forces to take military action against the extremist group's leadership. 
While there's general support for the plan, the Republicans want stronger measures and some Democrats say the resolution goes too far. If the request is approved, it would authorize a military campaign for three years without geographical restrictions. It would also be the first war authorization since then President George W. Bush sought authority to wage war in Iraq in 2002. The U.S. has conducted airstrikes against IS targets in Iraq and Syria since August last year, leading a coalition of Western and Arab nations. Obama said that although existing statutes provide him with the authority to take these actions, Congress backing would show the world that the U.S. is united in its resolve to crush IS. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. And turning back to Europe now, Greek officials and EU finance ministers failed to reach an agreement in their latest meeting. So Athens is seeking to extend a 240 billion euro bailout deal before the deadline at the end of this month. So how did the meeting unfold? Well, despite over seven hours of talks in Brussels, the parties were not able to bridge their differences over the debt assistance program. They were so far apart that they couldn't even agree on a conclusion to Wednesday's negotiations. The new leftist Greek government blames the deal for its economic hardship and is demanding a reduction of its debt. But Germany, the biggest contributor to Greece's bailout, is not willing to give in unless sufficient conditions are met. Eurogroup chairman Jerome Disselbloom said more time was needed. And we discussed the possibility of an extension. Um, and for some, it was clear that that is the preferred option. Uh, but we haven't quite come to that conclusion as yet. Um, the institutions have made quite clear that they stand ready uh, to work with the Greek authorities. Um, but it needs a political conclusion first for the institutions to start that kind of work. The negotiating parties have another chance next Monday to try and hammer out a potential deal before Greece runs out of time with its European creditors. Meanwhile, in Athens, thousands rallied in front of the Greek parliament in support of the government's anti-austerity stance. Mm. And finally, Paul, justice has been served. A court in Italy handed down a guilty verdict and a 16-year jail sentence, actually, to the runaway captain of the doomed cruise liner, the Costa Concordia. How did this ruling play out? Well, it took the panel of three judges just about five hours to reach that guilty verdict, capping a 19th-month trial. Francesco Scatillo was convicted of multiple man manslaughter charges, causing a shipwreck and one of the highest profile maritime disasters in recent years. He and his defense team had requested a plea bargain, which was denied. They've already said they'll appeal the verdict. Costco Cruises was also jointly ordered to pay a total of 30,000 euros in compensation to each of the ship's passengers. After the verdict was read, many of the survivors and victims' relatives expressed their disappointment, calling the punishment too lenient. I think that uh, they could make a lot more. Uh, they, they decided to balance uh, the judgment uh, between, uh, you know, uh, Scatino responsibilities and uh, the compensation for uh, compensations uh, for passengers. They could do a lot more, and probably they will, because we're gonna have to Scotillo was at the helm in 2012 when the Costco and Concordia moved too close to shore and crashed into rocks off the Tuscan island Chagillo. He fled the giant ship, abandoning his 4,200 passengers and crew before they could be rescued. A total of 32 people were lost in the disaster. Charity? And it looks like they're going to appeal, so let's uh, watch how that process unfolds. Thank you so much, Paul, for those stories, and we will see you again in just about two hours. Hello and welcome. I'm Kim Bo-kyung with your Weather Outlook. 
Microdust has finally moved out, giving away to bright and clear skies, and visibility on the roads has also opened up to 20 kilometers in parts of Gyeongsangbuk-do province. But dry weather advisories continue for the Gangwon-do and Gyeongsangdo provinces and parts of Gyeonggi-do as well. Numbers should remain below seasonal averages through tomorrow, so morning lows are shaping up to be chillier than today, but daytime highs will be similar to today under bright and clear skies. Looking ahead, some good news that warm air will move in on a Saturday, leading to mild conditions, but there is a chance of flurries or drizzles here in Seoul on Sunday. Here are the readings for Friday. Seoul starts off the day at minus 6 before reaching 3 in the afternoon. Gwangju and Daegu hit 6. Meanwhile, Jeju tops out at 8. Snow is expected on Tokdo and Mount Kumgang reaches minus 9. That'll do it for now, and I'll see you soon. Thank you very much, Pogyang, and that does it for this edition of Arirang News. Thanks for watching.